welcome to Fruity Knitting. This is episode 69. I'm Andrea. I'm Madeline. And I'm Andrew. And as you can see, we're sitting on somebody else's couch today. And the reason for that is that we're on holidays in Snowdonia in Northern Wales. We're going to be showing you a bit of the wonderful scenery around here. We'll tell you a little bit of our holiday activities. But the main feature on today's episode is a two-part interview on the latest issue of Pom Pom magazine. That's right. And in the first part of the interview, we meet Megan Fernandez, who is one of the co-founders of the magazine. And Megan tells us briefly about how Pom Pom got started, but then she talks about the creation of this issue. In the second part of the interview, the, the guest uh, editor, Nora Gon, joins us to talk about how she came up with the inspiration and how she worked with all the other designers. And listening to Nora's description of the designs really makes them come to life. It's very interesting, very exciting interviews, I think. Yeah, yep. so you'll enjoy that. Mm -hmm. We also get to meet Virginia Sattler Reimer as our guest on Knitters of the World. And if you don't know Virginia's work already, then you're in for a good surprise there as well. Yep, we're also announcing our cow winners. We'll be taking, uh, hearing from our very special guest, Madeline, our daughter. Yes. But first of all, we want to tell you a little bit about where we are. We've been spending the last five Christmases here in, in Snowdonia. Um, we love the area because of the really spectacular scenery and because of the great walking opportunities. Yeah. So we've hired a, a really charming uh, little cottage in a very tiny village called Kapilgaman. But unfortunately, there's no internet connection here and no mobile phone coverage. And that's not normally a problem for us because we do like to be very remote in the wilderness for our holidays. But we have to edit and upload this episode, which means we have to come up with a very creative solution. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Although if you're watching it, then we've solved that problem. <laughs> That's true, so you don't have to worry. <laughs> you also might hear a little bit of snoring in the background. That's Jack, our dog, so um, you'll know where that's coming from. Yeah. But so right now we're gonna show you a little bit of footage of the charming village that we're staying in and just the, the, the immediate surrounding area. So as I said, the village is called Kapil Garman. It's named after a saint, Saint Germanus, who lived sometime in the fourth century. It's an extremely quiet village. We do occasionally see a couple of people walking around, but not many. And our house is opposite the village pub, which is called the White Horse Inn. And that's actually closed from November to March. So that tells you how quiet the village gets. <laughs> But there is a very sweet village church with a picturesque grave site, which we can view from our bedroom window. So it's extremely charming to wake up every morning to that lovely view. So Kapil Garman sits high up in some rolling hills and the view looking across the hills and fields to the distant mountains is really beautiful. And just around 800 metres down the road from our house is a Neolithical burial chamber which dates back to around five and a half thousand years ago. So this site has been used repeatedly as a sacred burial site throughout the millennia until in the Victorian times a local farmer discovered it and decided to use it as a stable. Yeah. <laughs> I yeah. think he actually ploughed through one of the walls. That's right. He yeah. didn't know what it was. No. So it was repurposed. Yeah. <laughs> We're going to take you to one of these beautiful mountains in the region later in the show, but right now we need to talk about knitting, and we're going to start with you, Madeline. Yes. Yeah. So since I started university, I haven't actually done much knitting because uni keeps me very busy, and, yeah, so nobody around me knits. Um, so I kind of forget about it a bit and it's very different from at home when both of these people knit here <laughs> and I see mum doing all the interviews and so on and I do actually find them inspiring and they make me want to start knitting again and pick up my needles. So you have to watch more of our podcast. Yes, I do. <laughs> <laughs> but you have brought the knitting with us. So I've tell brought us about the knitting it. with me on holiday um, to catch up on it a bit. Um, and it's called Bressa. It's from Marie Wallen's Shetland book. It's knitted in the Jamesons of Shetland. Spindrift. Spindrift, yeah, thanks. <laughs> and do you remember the name uh, of the colorway? Bra Brambury? Brambury. That's right. Bramble. Bramble. Oh, Bramble. Okay. Bramble. It's a really stunning color that looks like raspberries and blackberry puree. Uh, yeah. Delicious. <laughs> yep. And, yeah, so it's a very fine gauge. It's almost like machine knitting in a sense. Um, the, what is the, gauge the gauge? is 29 stitches and 31 rows for 10 centimetres. Um, yeah, so you knit it from the bottom up in the round, so that this is the body, and then you knit the sleeves from the bottom up and join them onto the body when you get to the armholes. 
and then you knit the yoke and the yoke actually has a ferrule pattern I've never done ferrule before so this is my first ferrule project and it's quite an ambitious project but yeah. I think because you love it so much it's important to have a, a design you're really inspired yeah to have as a as an end product yes yep. yeah it's gorgeous cool yeah. okay so what else have you learned you've well, learned something recently yes in the meantime mum's taught me how to weave in the old yarn no the new bottom yarn yeah <laughs> have you really learned it <laughs> weaving in the new yarn and moving yes. out the old yarn yes that's right and Dals, just to get this clear who exactly taught you how to do that both of these guys yeah, both of them. mum showed me and because i got so confused she said dad come and watch as well and mm -hmm. dad actually ended up showing me how it goes yeah. so yeah. thank you so just in case you didn't understand that, that was just <laughs> weaving in a new ball of yarn and weaving out the old ball as you knit along so that when you're finished, you don't need to weave in all the yes. ends. You can just chop them off. Yep. And I think you know how to do that now, don't yes. you? Yes, and apparently that'll help me learn the two-handed ferrule technique as well. Yeah. 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 So that's right, because you hold it in a similar way. Yes. Well, well done. looking forward to that. <laughs> So it's my turn now and it is actually very exciting to be able to show a work in progress by a designer who you're also featuring on the same episode. Mm. So I'm doing Nora Gon's Nightingale and that's the design on the, on the front cover of the pom-pom issue here. You may not be able to see it there, it's quite dark and green. I'm not doing dark green, I'm doing another colour. It is vaguely green. Quite <laughs> green. So this is the back which is almost finished. It's just a few more rows on the shoulders and then I'll be finished. I'm using the Hebridean 3-ply yarn by Alice Darmore and the colourway is called Pebble Beach. Because the lighting's not brilliant here and we are on holidays, I'm not going to show you a whole lot of close-up and, and talk about it in, in too much detail. I will later in another episode. But in case you can't see, it's got hundreds of little different colours. It's just really like a wet pebble on the beach it's reflecting. Beautiful. Yeah, reflecting the sunlight. Yeah. So here we go. Now, as I told you last episode, I had knitted about 15 centimetres of the cable pattern down here, and then I realised that my gauge was was too short in the row gauge even though my gauge swatch was perfect so the pattern says to do a stocking stitch gauge and I did that and my um, gauge was perfect if a pattern says that but yet you're actually going to do it on quite a complicated cable pattern then you really do need to swatch in pattern I think because it, anyway I to, to try to avoid that I'm always uh, regularly checking my gauge particularly on a, on a complicated pattern so I unpicked it back to the ribbing down the bottom and I added about three centimeters in length before I started um, the the main part of the cable design and because the, basically I wanted this part here to be resting on the sternum so I didn't want to add my length up the top or all of it down the bottom so I, I put three centimeters down the bottom I started the armhole shaping a couple of rows early and I added a couple of rows in up here before I started the shoulder shaping so I think it should work out well now I'll tell you a little bit about the cable pattern itself it's actually pretty easy so if you think it's looking very complicated and out of your skill range think again <laughs> <laughs> one of the reasons why it's really easy is because it's symmetrical right and left so whatever you're doing in the second half of the row is just a reverse of what you've done in the first half and that just breaks the pattern down and makes it so much more simple the chart symbols in the pattern are also really well done you can actually understand what you're meant to be doing by simply looking at the symbol and that's really important because you don't want to have to keep looking back at the key reading what the chart's meant to mean and then go back to the chart and try to figure it out so that I found really pleasant there were some errata in the chart which um, can be annoying but in this case it wasn't so hard because it's symmetrical often there would be a, like a little mistake not often there weren't that many maybe two uh, two or three but there was a little mistake on on one side but all you had to do is do the reverse of what you'd done on this side so that was not a problem at all I didn't even revert to any of the corrections in the errata I just spotted it immediately and just did what was meant so yeah that was cool now what else did I want to say 
there is a little bit of puckering going on here, you might notice, just underneath this cable here. So the stocking stitch cable is actually traveling at a very steep curve over the reverse stocking stitch. And I don't know if that's the reason why it's puckering or possibly it could even be that my row gauge is slightly shorter so it's um, traveling at an even steeper curve. That's sort of a physics problem for you, Andrew. <laughs> <laughs> but I am fairly confident that when I block it hard, it should straighten out. I know this yarn does block really well. And what I would try to do is stretch this section, just stretch the cable if possible without mm. uh, stretching this at all and, and see if that works. I'm hoping that that should work. But also when it's sewn, the top of it is sewn on to the sleeves, it will pull it. If you hold yours, resist mm -hmm. me, it, it'll pull it a little bit more and that should straighten it out. So there's the back. The front is exactly the same as the back, except for, of course, the, the front neck scoops down a little bit lower. But I'm very pleased with it. It's coming on roaringly. It's looking, <laughs> it's looking beautiful, Mum. And I hope, Nora, if you're watching this, that you find it meets your standard. Yeah. <laughs> So your turn, Andrew. So it's my turn. So my current project is Andrea's hiking jacket. And I have to say my designer features on this show as well, because this is a design by Andrea. It's called Andrea's hiking jacket. Um, <laughs> and we're using a particular design technique here, which is very, very exciting. Very simple design. You can't call yeah. it a design. <laughs> so progress coming along in great strides. I wanted to throw that in. Um, the design technique is called just in time design. So the way it works is... <laughs> I do the little ribbing here for the hem and then Andrea figures out the shaping for the waist and, and these figures. And then I knitted all that up and just in time, we actually both together figured out the numbers for the armhole shaping here. So it's pretty exciting living on the edge, pushing the boundary. Yeah. But I think it's going well. Knitting does, dangerously. Knitting dangerously. It does play to my strengths. Um, a lot of plain stocking stitch here, so I'm roaring along. Now for new viewers, there have been some comments on this striking colour. But the purpose of this colour is for people to find me in the uh, blizzards yeah. of the snow because it <laughs> is a hiking jacket. Helicopter spotting. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, it's going to be great. <laughs> but you're doing well. So that's that. It's beautiful. Um, coming up now is Megan Fernandez in part one of our Pom Pom interview. And when we come back, we're going to be announcing the cow winners. Yay. <laughs> Welcome to Fruity Knitting. We're going to have an exciting look behind the scenes of the latest Pom Pom magazine, which is their winter edition, issue number 27. And this issue was a collaboration with Nora Gon as the guest editor. And I think the result is a very exciting collection of designs. The theme was the idea of tough Victoriana, which combines a type of soft, sweet beauty with strong, powerful drama. It's an unusual combination or concept, and it's brought about very exciting and imaginative results. And we're gonna hear from Nora Gon about her role as the guest editor later in the program, but first, we're gonna to talk to Megan Fernandez, who is one of the co-founders of the Pom Pom Magazine. And Megan is joining us from Austin, Texas. So Megan, thanks so much for coming on Fruity Knitting. Thank you so much for having me. 
So the Pom Pom magazine is very well known, but just for any viewers who may not be familiar with um, your magazine, can you give us an introduction to how uh, you and your co-founder Lydia got together and started the publication and just also say something about the concept of the magazine and how that's developed. Well, we started nearly seven years ago now. It'll be seven years ago, um, um, January 2019. And... Um, uh, when we met, we were both working at the kind of iconic London yarn shop, Loop. Um, I had lived in London for 10 years, and um, we had both recently finished our degrees, mine, our, our master's degrees. Mine was in um, English language and literature, and Lydia's was in linguistics. And um, I'd written my master's thesis in knitting and women's literature. Um, and so it was the perfect place for, for me to be and for both of us to be. Um, we were inspired every day by the gorgeous yarns on the shelves and the people of London. And, um, but we both felt like we needed a creative project. And um, we saw the knitting magazines coming in and out of the shop and just felt like there wasn't anything that really spoke to us um, personally. Um, there was... It was the start of that time when indie dyers and indie designers were really um, coming to the forefront um, on Ravelry and, and everywhere else and in the shop that we were working in. Um, and there wasn't a magazine that really spoke to that yet. Um, we were also inspired by the kind of renaissance of print that was happening um, in other magazines, one in particular um, that I really loved. Um, it's called Frankie, and it came out of Australia. Um, and they were just printed on gorgeous paper and had a certain tone that really um, that we really appreciated. So we thought that um, the knitting world needed something like it. And we didn't have super grand ideas at first, but um, we thought that we could just give it a try, and we did everything ourselves um, in the first issue, pretty much. Um, and it's kind of crazy how much it's grown since then. We started off printing just 500 copies, which now that I think about it, it seems like a lot for us to have, to have done considering we didn't yeah. really know what we were doing, but, um, but now we're up to more like 13,000, which is, which is really crazy. That's fantastic. And then you moved to back to the U S so you can imagine that that would have been, um, perhaps challenging to start off with, but it would also have its advantages. So just tell us a little bit about that move. And also, did you notice a difference between the tastes of knitters in the US compared to the UK? Yeah, sure. Yeah, it was because I lived in the UK for so long, it was kind of a big step for me to come back to the US. Um, and, you know, it was sad for Lydia and I to, to not be in the same place at the same time anymore. But um, in a lot of ways, it's been great for us. Um, we're such good friends that often if we're in the same room together, we get almost nothing done because <laughs> we're just having a good time. So having our own spaces is nice. Um, and it's nice for the magazine because we can shoot our summer issue, for example, in March in Austin, where it actually feels and looks like summer. Um, and our autumn and winter issues in the UK, where it can often look like um, uh autumn in August, um, in London. So, um, that's been handy. It's also been handy for me to kind of get to know the American market and, um, our, our North American knitters a little bit better. Um, one thing I noticed when I came back about the difference between the two groups of, of knitters is that, um, Surprisingly, I think Americans can be a little bit more conservative in, in what they wear. Um, the English and the British, um, can often have a slightly more eccentric um, style, which I miss a little bit. And now you've got quite a few employees, haven't you? So it's really grown. It's not just you and Lydia. No, we, uh, nothing would happen now if it was just me and Lydia. We are so lucky to have um, um, our members of staff. And we brought um, all seven of us to Rhinebeck in New York, for example, um, this past autumn, which was amazing. And it was the first time that all seven of us had been in the same place at the same time. So, um, yeah, we're truly international. <laughs> we have a Canadian now as well, um, which is great. So, um, yeah, we've, it's, it's amazing how we've grown and it seems to have gone by so fast. And this is the second time that you've used a guest editor. The first time was Juju Vale for issue 22. So, um, could you classify, um, 
the designs that are in pom-pom, would you say that you've got a certain look? Could you describe it to us? I know it's hard to generalise, but what would you say is, is the general pom-pom look and then how would you say, Nora, what edge has, did Nora bring to it, you know, or what edge did you imagine she'd bring to it? Well, Lydia and I never set out with, um, you know, like a marketing guide about or a branding guide about what we were. It was really just stuff that Lydia and Megan like. Um, but a lot of people do tell us that they see something and they know it's pom-pom and that we do have a distinctive look. Um, and, and a lot of times I think that involves color. It involves slightly boxier, looser shapes or cropped silhouettes. Um, so, and I think that we kind of tend to have a little hint of fun in, in everything that we do. So yeah, asking Nora, we really didn't know what to expect, but we were... We were ready for something um, different, I think. Dramatic. Um, <laughs> dramatic, exactly. Dramatic is the perfect word. Um, and But we didn't. We had no idea um, that it would be as dramatic and uh, as it was. Um, and we were so pleased with the end result. Say something about the yarn companies. Uh, do you have any prerequisites for who you work with or um, is it purely on the designs themselves that you look at the designs and think, okay, so now we're going to pick this yarn or do you try to first of all pick some yarn companies and then use incorporate their yarns right from the beginning into the designs? Yeah, so when we're um, choosing yarns for an issue of the magazine, um, it's really designer-led um, and the design um, starts as the focus. So... Um, we always have yarn companies in the backs of our minds that we go, oh, we'd really love to work with them one day, but we don't say, oh, that yarn company has to be in this issue because if the right design isn't there, then it, there's just no point. Um, so for Nora's issue, um, you know, we wanted to kind of stay away from super variegated or speckled or anything because it had such a sort of historical and classic kind of look. Um, but the designer is definitely the starting point. And we always ask them to, to recommend a yarn or three that might work, um, for the design. Um, and then, you know, we go from there. The, the tricky part really is to find the yarns that will work with the design from all these different designers in the palette that we've chosen, because yarn companies can have such different palettes, um, that you really want to make sure that everything works together. And interestingly, the, the cardigan that I mentioned previously by Linda Marbang, um, had been knit in an orange that we thought, um, would be maybe a little bit rusty kind of orange, kind of a deep orange, but it turned out to be quite a bright orange. So we ended up having it re-knit in time for the shoot. And it's quite quite the cardigan. It's like super cabled and, and took a long time and a lot of effort. But the color that we ended up settling on turned out to be perfect for the palette. So um, sometimes you just don't know if you don't have a shade card in front of you if, from all the different yarn companies that you're working with, um, if something is going to be spot on. Um, so in this case, we really wanted to make it perfect. And I think that it was something that was worth doing. Sort of additionally, you want to sort of think about um, the weights of yarns that you're going to use. For this issue, you know, we were never going to use something that was super chunky, even though it was a winter issue, just because the look and the feel um, of the concept just wouldn't have lended itself to a super chunky yarn. Um, the, the weights of the yarns, can be important. We don't want every single design in an issue to be fingering weight or four ply. Um, so it's something that we do consider, but we definitely let the designs and the concept of the issue um, dictate the, the weights that we choose more than just trying to have variety for variety's sake. I reckon it must have been a very valuable and exciting experience for you guys to work so closely with Nora Gon because she is so talented and so experienced and especially because, especially because she had a wealth of experience from her previous role as the design director with Barocco Yarns. So I'm just wondering what are the, um, well, are there some points that you, you learnt from this experience of, of working with her? Did she give you any fresh ideas how you might either edit in the future or work with designers or what was interesting? What did you pick up, you know, working closely with her? It was really amazing to watch her direct the other designers um, in a way that we don't normally do um, when we put out calls for submissions. Um, for example, Cerulea Rose, who she had worked with or who had worked uh, really for Nora for a long time um, at Barocco. Uh, it was great to see how she directed Cerulea 
with her design um, because she had these designers that she wanted to work with. So she knew a lot about them already and, and what their style was. And she had asked Cerulea to rework a previous design of hers, um, the shape of it, um, to fit this um, particular issue. And it looks like a completely different um, sweater, but she said, you know, let's try to use the shape, but, you know, build on that. Um, and, and use your experience having made that original sweater to make something that's totally different and maybe even um, improves on the design a little bit. With Zandy Peters, who has a totally different um, design style to, to what this issue um, was going to look like, I think, personally. Um, it was amazing that Nora had the foresight to, to see that something that Zandy would do would be interesting and beautiful. Um, and this is Zandy's shawl here, you can see, um, which I think just turned out to be completely stunning, um, that she had the foresight to know that that would work. Yes, I love her design. It looks very Victoriana. It's, it's a stunning, stunning shawl, yeah. There wasn't what I would call a lot of of tinkering with the designer's um, um, original pieces. Uh, as I mentioned, Linda Marvings turned out to be a mashup of different things um, that she had yeah. thought about having in different pieces, but that actually worked together really well. Um, it's one of my favorite designs from that issue, and, and it's kind of, um, I'm trying to think of a better word than Frankenstein, <laughs> kind of <laughs> mashup <laughs> of uh, different uh, elements that turned out really beautifully that Linda probably, you know, might not have thought to put together um, herself, but with Nora's direction, um, it just turned out so, so stunning. Um, they're some of my favorite photos we've ever done um, for Pom Pom, really. Okay, well, look, let's just finish up by talking about the photo shoot and the styling. So can you tell us a bit about your styling team and also how you came up with the amazing set as a concept, because it really is gorgeous. It's very floral and Victorian and very dramatic with the black sort of lighting. So tell us about that. We were trying to come up with something that wouldn't be too costumey and too sort of um, anachronistic um, for, for the shoot so that it would still kind of have a pom-pom feel, but definitely convey the Victorian warrior woman um, aesthetic that Nora had gone for. Um, and... It was really, really exciting for me. We're actually shooting in Austin this time, um, a winter issue, <laughs> which is great. Um, and we shot it here, which um, is my office. It also happens to be my converted garage. <laughs> um, so it's kind of my home studio, but also, you know, other Pump Pump staff come here and work as well. But um, there's a florist based in Austin whose um, work I'd always admired and always wanted to work with but hadn't quite come up with the right uh, concept for an issue to work with her yet. When I thought about Nora's issue and her work um, and, and, and she's called Bricolage uh, Curated Florals, um, I thought that it could really, really work together. The drama of these knits with the drama of these flowers, which um, Samantha, who owns Bricolage, usually shoots on black backdrops um, that just really clicked for me. And I, and I suggested it to Nora, hoping that she would agree. Samantha's photos often reminded me of sort of Dutch oil paintings, um, which wasn't really right for the Victorian theme that we were going with. So I, I turned to Pom Pom's resident art historian, Francesca, who has um, degrees in art history, how I could kind of make it work. Um, and I had sort of thought about um, Millet, um, Ophelia in particular, but I was sort of put off by the idea that, you know, a lot of Victorian painting shows kind of the damsel in distress um, trope of women, which is not what we were going for at all. Um, and Francesca, you know, sent me loads of references of paintings that um, kind of did have this dramatic darker backgrounds, but with florals and, you know, reminded me about the Victorian language of flowers. Um, and I thought we could really spin that and turn it into, rather than the damsel in distress, the kind of warrior woman that Nora had envisioned. And so I proposed that to Nora and she was super excited, thank God. Um, and so that was, that was so exciting for us um, to try to put that together um, and then try to find models that would also embody that but also have them look a bit modern and, and, and have that 21st century kind of stronger woman um, sensibility about them. And then Francesca ended up writing all of the text that goes along 
with the patterns and really kind of giving art history lessons with each design and naming them uh, in that way. And, and it just came together so beautifully. And it's, it's a really clever thing because what it does is it takes all of these individual designs and make them look like they're a unified collection. Like that really comes through strongly in the book with the setting and, and the little stories and the whole theme. It's, I think it's very exciting. It's so cool. Thank so how, you so much. So how long did it take you to do the photo shoot? For an issue of Pom Pom, we usually take one day. I think for our um, anniversary issue, we took two days because um, that just had a little bit of extra going on. But we try to fit everything into two, into one day. And um, over our 28 <laughs> or so issues, we've become pretty efficient at that and and figuring out how to direct models and knowing what we want ahead of time and doing a whole lot of prep before that um, to to work that out. And we did a lot of prep with Nora, who we invited to Austin for the shoot, but as you can imagine, she's a very busy lady, so she wasn't able to make yeah. it. Um, but we did a lot of, well, um, here in Austin, you know, putting different outfits together, sending her a snap of that, seeing if she liked it or not. Um, and she didn't always like it. <laughs> so we had to like, you know, start over with an outfit or whatever. But on the day, you know, um, it comes down to what it looks like on the model with the backdrop um, through the camera's lens. And sometimes you just have to add or change things, edit things a little bit. So um, it felt like a lot of responsibility for me to, to, to do something that Nora was going to be really happy with. Um, and so I was trying yeah. to channel her the whole time. Um, and she seemed like she was mostly happy with everything that I did. So um, that was a relief. So just really quickly before we finish, what are the typical things that can go wrong on a photo shoot? Is there a funny story that happened that's related to this one? Did anything go wrong or did it just go completely smoothly? Uh, it didn't go completely smoothly. And I will say that we have in the past, not this time, shot a garment backwards <laughs> and had to go back and fix that. <laughs> um, at this shoot, something kind of scary happened. Um, and that a model didn't show up and, and we were worried for her safety. It turned out that she was fine and that she had actually been in a car accident, but that she was safe, but her phone had been smashed um, in, in the accident. So she wasn't able to communicate with us why she hadn't turned up until much later that day. Um, but luckily our makeup artist also happens to have modeled for us before, Elena um, Espinaco, and she's such a talented hair and makeup artist. Um, and, you know, there was a point kind of late morning that day where we realized, you know, we were going to have to do something. Um, and so we asked her to step in and she was so gracious and great and did her own hair and makeup um, and then ended up on the cover of the issue wearing Nora's sweater. So um, we would never have had that really powerful photo that ended up here on the cover of the magazine if, um, if that hadn't happened. So sometimes things just work out the way that they're, they're meant to, to work out. Yeah, well, she looks stunning. It looks fantastic. And that's definitely, um, I'm gonna knit this design. I'm really excited to knit it. I'm just waiting for my yarn to come, but it's a really beautiful, dramatic design, but still very wearable. And I think the whole con um, collection is very wearable. So it's been super um, cool to get to talk to you and um, just hear a little bit about what goes on behind Pom Pom. So thanks so much for spending time with us. Thank you so much for having me. It's been such a pleasure um, being able to talk about the experience. Welcome back. If you're planning to knit one of the designs in the latest Pom Pom issue, or maybe you've even started one of the designs, you're really gonna enjoy the second interview with Nora Gone, which is at the end of the program. Nora talks about the inspirational sources for each of the designs, and that's super interesting. There's a lot of talk about costumes and historical fashion details, which I find super cool. And Pom Pom is offering Fruity Knitting patrons a discount on this latest issue, which is number 27 for a limited time. The issue includes the patterns for 10 designs. There's also an article titled Knitting Beyond Tradition by Anna Maltz and a recipe for bread, which you can cable or plait, whatever you think is more knitterly. So thank you very much, Pom Pom. 
But right now, as we promised, it's time to announce the winners for the two cows that ended on Christmas Day. Yep, and first up is the Fruity Mitts and Gloves cow, which had a total of 331 entrants. So thank you yeah. very much and congratulations to everyone who joined in there. We had a really broad range of knitters taking part from experienced glove knitters to knitters who were doing their very first mitts or gloves project. We've donated three prizes for this cow. The first winner has Ravelry name Das mache ich im Zug, which is actually German for what I do in the train. That was entry number three. We don't have a first name, but he or she has knitted the Garden Dreams mittens by Tina Koo in the Jemisons of Shetland Spindrift yarn. So congratulations. We're donating a 20 euro gift voucher for the Nature's Luxury online store. There's some wonderful yarns and other goodies there to choose from. The second winner is Noni McNitt, who is entry number 296. Robin gifted the Café Oli mitts by Paula McKeever as a gift for her sister. Perhaps she received them for Christmas, which would be lovely. Robin, we're gifting you a $25 gift voucher to use at Schoolhouse Press, which is Meg Swanson's amazing online store. Their online store has a ton of stuff for you to choose from. And our third winner is Net5444, who is entry number 146. Annette knitted a bunch of the Speedy Selbu mittens by Scandia Knits for her co-workers, which is a really lovely thing to do. Lucky Annette has a bunch of wonderful co-workers, definitely a blessing, and Annette herself is obviously an amazing co-worker with her very generous gifts. Annette, we're donating a $25 gift voucher for you to use at the Woolly Thistles online store. So congratulations to all of the winners and the participants in our Mitts and Gloves Cal. And now it's time to move on to the Knit for Our Man, Knit for Your Man Cal. <laughs> <laughs> knit for Your Man Cal. And yeah. I have to say that this was one of my very favourite cows that we've ever put on. And the, the background to this cow was we've now been to two Edinburgh Yarn Festivals and two Shetland Wool Week Festivals. And it was great to meet a whole lot of different knit knitters and talk to them. It's also been great great to talk to the designers that we've interviewed and what I found interesting was that surprisingly few knitters have actually knitted a sweater for their significant male other in their life even though that significant male other may have been asking for a sweater for many years so we thought we might just move things, push along, things along in a positive direction there. The other thing is that there's quite a lot of designers have said that there's not really a market for male garments and I think that's a bit sad because I'm always looking out for an exciting male garment to knit for Andrew. So we thought we'd do a little bit of encouraging and enabling with this cowl and it's been wonderful to see the results. So many happy men proudly wearing their hand knitted jumpers and a whole lot of knitters who have earned a tremendous amount of brownie points from knitting those jumpers. So congratulations to all of you. We've just been showing here um, quickly a sample of the finished garments but all of them deserve a prize so well done to all of you. And we have three prizes. So the first prize goes to Aoife from France who is Evasion 71 and was entry number 82. Aoife knitted the 9025 jacket by Phil Katia which she only just finished in time and that was because she ran out of wool and finally received the missing ball but it was not in the same dye lot. Nevertheless congratulations Aoife that's fantastic and we're donating your prize it is a 30 euro gift voucher for the De Rerum Natura online store. That's a French company and I've been actually dying to try out their yarn so enjoy looking for something that's just right for you. Our second prize goes to Jin Jin from the Philippines who is Snoopy25 and entry number 58. Jin Jin knitted the Urban Hiker by Tin Can Knits for her husband who was a great sport and tried it on several times to make sure it fitted properly. So well done Jin Jin and well done Mr Jin Jin for being so knitworthy. Your prize is the stunning garment size project bag and matching handmade knitting notebook donated and made by Yvonne from Made by Ganache. That is a really beautiful, beautiful prize. So that's really exciting. Well done. Third prize goes to Yvonne from Germany, who is Wally One and entry number 72. And Yvonne knitted her own design called Next One for her son, who really loves it. Yay, brilliant result. You never know with sons. <laughs> <laughs> And Yvonne played with colours and used the effects of the double stranded yarn to create a mild fabric on the body and had a clean contrasting colour work on the yoke, which was using a traditional Norwegian inspired design. 
So Yvonne, your prize we're also donating and that is a 30 euro gift voucher for the Nature's Luxury online store. And we've met Danica who is the owner of Nature's Luxury and she's a lovely person herself but she also creates amazingly beautiful hand-dyed yarns. Congratulations and thank you to all of our cow participants. We do have a new cow running right now. It's the Cables and Lace Cow that started just recently. It runs until the end of February. Um, the conditions here are it has to be a large project. So we're looking at a, an adult sweater or a rug or maybe a large shawl. And the rules are it has to be at least 50% of the surface area with either cables or lace or a mixture of, of the two. So that would be very exciting. Get into that. And the details of that, you can find them on the Fruity Knitting Revelry group. But right now we're going off to climb a mountain. We're going to take you to Mol Shabod. Yep. Yep. Okay, Mol Shabod is just a, a fantastic mountain. It has all the right criteria. It's got a gorgeous shape. It's a challenging hike. And at the end, you're rewarded with the most fantastic and marvellous views. That's everything you want in a mountain. And if you're a fantasy reader, you may actually have read William Horwood's The Duncan Chronicles. Yeah, yeah, I haven't read them. But they were published in the 90s, and one of the books in the Chronicles features Mol Shabod heavily. So yep. maybe this will be exciting for you. People say who've read the book that they it's it's when they actually go to the mountain, it's really eerily familiar, yep. which must feel great. Yep. <laughs> okay, so coming up now is just a two-minute mountain climb with spectacular views, and then we're going to meet Virginia Sattler Reimer. Virginia Sattler-Reimer. 
I remember the first time I went into a yarn shop, I was just old enough to go to the shops by myself, and I walked into this wall of Shetland yarn. It was when Spindrift came in skeins, and they had a pegboard with all the colors, and that's the moment I became someone who wanted all of the colors. I have always enjoyed making things, and I was lucky enough to grow up with two women who are very creative and encouraging. And so I developed a love for things made by hand, and textiles in particular. In college I got to study art and uh, experience a lot of different textile medium, which was fantastic. And although I learned to knit as a child, I didn't really pick it up until in my, I was in my 20s. I had a couple of students who were from Denmark who always had these beautiful knee highs on, and I eventually worked up the courage to ask them where they got them, and they told me they had made them themselves. So that moment was huge for me. It, it made me decide that I really wanted to learn how to knit, and socks in particular. So I signed up for a knitting class, and I also discovered Nancy Bush's book, Folk Socks, which introduced me to the world of the history of knitting and learning about different knitting traditions and techniques. And I went off the deep end, really knitting all the time and learning as much as I could, reading as much as I could. I got a job at a yarn store where I discovered Rowan and Kim Hargraves. And during my time there, I knit a lot of store samples, which I really enjoyed. All of those samples led to beginning to test knit professionally, which I also still enjoy for the challenge and sometimes for having somebody else tell me what to knit. From there it was a short leap to publishing my own designs, and because Ravelry makes such a fabulous platform and, and it fits the way that I like to work, that was an easy transition to make. When Kate asked me to design a hat pattern for her Milwaukee Heads book, I was very excited, of course, and I knew right away that I wanted to use these five colors. I designed this tam and named it after a state park in northern Minnesota that my husband and I like to hike in, Tedagoosh, and I used motifs that reflected that area to me. I had so much fun with this tam that I decided to make a pair of matching mitts, so I used the same motifs and colors in the Tedagoosh mitts. Where I live in Minnesota, we have very long and cold winters, and one of the ways that I make that a little bit more bearable for myself is to use colors and motifs in accessory patterns that I might not use in a garment, just to brighten up January or February a little bit. So I'm really looking forward to wearing this set in the darker and longer months of winter here. Sometimes it's a motif that inspires me, as was the case in the midterm mittens. I fell in love with this geometric shape and I wanted to work out how to fit it into a mitten design. I used Jameson and Smith two ply jumper weight in more subtle colors, and after I finished those mittens, I decided I'd take the reverse process that I used from, for the Tedagoosh hats and mittens and work it into a tam. So I used that sweet geometric pattern at the base of the tam and then came up with something a little bit more dramatic for the crown. I think this is a more subtle set, and I'm quite pleased with the way it turned out. Sometimes it's texture that inspires me. That was the case with this Mora Pearl Cowl. I used Malabrigo's Mora yarn, which is 100% silk, and the colorway also inspired me in that I wanted to create something that would invoke pearls, waves, shells, that shimmery sort of underwater quality. This luscious fabric is something I knew I wanted to keep close to my neck and make the most of the drape that silk offers. I'm quite pleased with this cowl. In fact, I have fallen in love with the style of garment that I wear it all the time. The texture of the yarn inspired this next design as well. For these socks, this pattern is called My Fair Feet. I use Blacker Yarns British Classic 4-ply, a beautiful woolen spun yarn that when I started working with brought to mind the idea of the romantic idea of a sock that you might wear hiking, cozy, warming yourself by the fire. So I tried to keep that classic idea of a hiking sock and for the back of the leg I used a simple rib pattern. For the front I used a cable and texture stitch to keep the knitting interesting, but something simple enough to evoke that classic hiking sock idea. 
This next design was inspired by another place my husband and I like to go hiking, Gooseberry Falls State Park, although it's not a hiking sock. For this design, I was inspired more by the falls themselves, and so I used more of a cascading lace pattern down the front of the leg and foot. This is knit in a brighter color, obviously. I was thinking something lighter for spring, and it's using Madeline Tosh Twist Light. Knitting is endlessly captivating to me. I love how there's always more to learn about history, technique, tradition, the whole world of color and the way that colors interact with each other in different textures. I love that it connects me to knitters from around the world and different places. It's something that inspires me every day and really offers a great opportunity to explore my creativity. And it's something I'm very passionate about. I think it's going to be a big part of my life for a long time to come. Hello again. We hope you enjoyed seeing Mold Shabod and also getting to know Virginia. How many of you recognize that gorgeous cardigan that she was wearing? That's a design by Gudrun Johnston called Belmont. It's a really stunning classic design in a really fantastic color, of course. <laughs> I also want to comment on Virginia's beautiful red and blue shoes. They are just my style. I would love to have a couple of pair of colorful shoes like that in my wardrobe. I think they really showed off her sock patterns really well. She color combined them well. She's got a great sense of color, hasn't she? Mm. <laughs> Virginia is offering a 25% discount on all self-published patterns in her Ravelry store. There's lots of lovely things there to choose from, so have a fun time looking through. And the details of the discount are, as always, on our Patreon site. So thank you very much, Virginia. Some of our longer term viewers may recognize where we are right now. We actually filmed last year's Christmas episode from this very bench and we thought it would be fun to come back here and do it again this year. We are one year older and wiser a little bit. We've got a rug with us this year which is really nice. The path that we're on is actually a hiking path called the Fisherman's Way and it starts in a little town called Bedgellet. And Madeline, you've got a little story about Bedgellet for us. Yes, I do. Uh, the name Bedgellet means Gellet's grave and Gellet was a shaggy dog who belonged to Clewellyn the Great in the 13th century. Um, Clewellyn actually killed his dog because he thought that the dog had attacked his baby son. It was only later that he discovered that it was in fact a wild wolf who attacked his son and that uh, Gellet the dog had protected the boy. And That's so, very tragic. I know, it's very <laughs> tragic. And Clewellyn was struck with grief and remorse and then built a grave in, the, in memory of the dog's neck. Yeah, and yeah. the grave is still to be found in the, just in the vicinity of Bedgellet and it's still a very popular tourist attraction. So today is New Year's Eve, which also happens to be my mother's birthday. So happy birthday, Mum. Happy, happy birthday, birthday Joe. <laughs> we want to thank everybody who supported the show throughout 2018 by being a fruity knitting patron. In the last episode, we told you that our goal was to have Andrew working on the show full time with me so that we can make the workload sustainable and keep the show going. That's really important to us and is our clear goal for the first half of 2019. So we want to thank everybody who's responded to our request. Thank you very much. Since our last episode, we've also received many messages from long-time patrons expressing their support for the show. And that has been very encouraging and extremely heartwarming. Thank you so much for caring and supporting us. So as we say every episode, if you do enjoy the show, you appreciate it and want it to continue, then do please become a patron. Thank you very much. 
Next up is Nora Gorn, who's joining us today in her role as guest editor of the current issue of the Pom Pom magazine. It's really interesting to hear Nora talk about her collaboration with the other designers on this collection, so I'm sure you're going to in enjoy this interview. Nora is also offering a 25% discount on all self-published patterns in her Ravelry store. This discount is available to Fruity Knitting patrons, and some of her designs are definitely suitable for our current cables and lace cowl. So if you'd like to join in and you're looking for a design, then check them out. And thank you very much to Nora. So it's time for us to say goodbye now. Because of the dates that we're travelling back, there's going to be another three week break before the next episode. But after that, we'll be back to every two weeks again. And on our trip back, we're also going to be fitting in some extra interviews, which we know you'll enjoy at some later date. We've had a fantastic year and we're really grateful for your company throughout the year. Thank you so much. We wish you many blessings for the year 2019. Lots of joy, peace, friendships, and of course, many exciting new knitting projects. So we'll say goodbye and we'll see you soon. Yep, thanks for being with us. Bye. Bye. Joining us now is Nora Gon, and she's going to talk about her role as the guest editor of the latest Pom Pom magazine, the Winter 2018 edition. We've already featured a full interview with Nora earlier this year where she talks about her career journey, her fantastic knitted cable source book, and she also goes into a lot of detail about how she develops her very unique cable patterns. So if you haven't already seen that interview, you can go back and watch episode 61. But today, Nora is going to share with us how she's worked together with a bunch of other great designers to come up with this very interesting collection. So Nora, welcome, and thank you so much for spending time with us again. Oh, you're so welcome. So Nora, what is it like to be a guest editor? Can you just explain the process and um, tell us what your responsibilities are? Well, the way Megan and Lydia set up the pom-pom issue and me being the guest designer, I got to do all of the fun bits. Like I came up with the theme and I made a list of the designers that I would love to work with. Um, it was about eight months before the issue was due that Megan got to me. So loads of time, it feels like loads of time, um, to work with all of this. And once we had the theme and we contacted the designers, well, what I sent to the designers was a beautiful PDF with loads of photos and words about what we were going to do. My theme was Tough Victoria. Um, once the designers had that, they worked on it for, I think it was about four weeks. Um, and then they sent sketches and swatches. Lydia and Megan and I all got together online and looked at everything and really there was a lot of great stuff to, to look at. It wasn't too hard. It was more fun than anything else. And um, there wasn't too much back and forth. Like we all had picked what our favorites were and they kind of overlapped a great deal. So it was easy to find our favorites. With um, There was one person I had to push, my friend Cerulea Rose, I had stuck in my head that I wanted to do um, kind of a variation on something she had done before, so we went back and forth a little with that, but mostly we got to pick from what the designers sent us. And then there were things we had to do like 
balance um, how many accessories are in the issue and how many sweaters. I tend to be very sweater focused, so the inspiration sheets had a lot of sweaters, and I think that's why we got a lot of sweater um, submissions. We kind of went with that. We have um, two accessories in the whole collection. One's a glove and one's a, uh, a shawl. So we kind of went with the proportions of the submissions that came in. And um, after that was all chosen, trying to balance it out, big things, small things, cardigans, pullovers, um, then it was the time to pick yarns and colors. So sometimes we went with the yarns that the designers had chosen, and in some cases the designers hadn't really specified that specifically, didn't care that specifically which yarn. And we went with some of our favorite people that we like to work with, um, yarn companies Pom Pom likes to work with, and yarn companies I like to work with, and um, that left, that leaves the uh, the color choices, which, you know, we had a theme that fit the Victoria, um, and we're trying to balance, you know, pinks and greens and staying kind of a muddy palette. Um, the one problem that came up is that um, it is hard to look at colors online. You don't really know what you're looking at. And there's one sweater that came in much too bright and orange to all of our dismay, and that ended up being re-knit. This sweater was lovely in the orange, and I love orange, but it wasn't <laughs> fitting in with the, the rest of the theme. I think that was our biggest uh, thing that we tripped over. So after you've sent um, the design brief to the designers, how much time do they have to, to send something back? And, and do they send back swatches or sketches or, or a combination of both? So they had about four weeks to make up um, a PDF submission that includes both a photo of swatches and a sketch. I think both things are very important. So we really knew what fabric they were going after and what proportion things were. As you said, the collection draws its inspiration from the Victorian era as well as female warriors and some historical costumes. But we would really, really love to hear lots of details about these great and very interesting inspirational sources. The whole theme of Victorian um, started with my like love of costuming, especially all the um, the costume dramas we've been seeing lately. You know, there's Victoria and Game of Thrones and Vikings and Rain and all from all different eras, but all like really exciting and strong um, details in those costumes. So I sort of start from there. And um, I looked up a lot of things like I love to be on Pinterest getting inspiration. And I had all sorts of inspiration that I did put in in the brief that I sent to the designers, um, and it showed different sleeves puffing at different points, at the shoulder, in the middle, at the bottom, yeah. um, combining that with bustles and a certain amount of ruffles, and military jackets fit all in there with me. And so that kind of came together to be like the modern woman warrior with all these little details. And it, it mixes sweet things with strong things. Um, and even though I kind of started with the Victorian era as the seed of the inspiration, it ended up being um, anachronistic. Like I didn't care if there was a little detail from Vikings um, as opposed to it being a Victorian era thing. Yeah. Um, it all like pulled it together. Is this kind of Victorian or, or historical um, costume idea that had been playing around in your mind, is that something that you'd been thinking about doing for quite a while or is it something that you just popped into your head after Pom Pom had contacted you? Actually, it's been something brewing for a long time. I, I think it kind of starts, if I want to be indulgent about it, it kind of starts like way back when I was a kid and loved to wear my flannel nightgown as if it were a lovely gown, like tied with ribbons or tied so it was more warrior-like or, or kind of Roman. Or I think that the love of that starts back in my childhood, yeah. which probably isn't too unusual, like loads of little girls <laughs> like things like that. And I, but I've always liked those things and not necessarily been that comfortable wearing them. It depends like 
whether it's the 70s or the 90s or the 2000s, like those things come in and out of fashion. And in the last 20 years, I've been concentrating on um, more clean and adult, that's quite not quite the right word, but, um, but more modern kinds of things. And suddenly all this past love is like really bubbled up, that I do love these things and I do love the strong version of ruffles and sleeves and and I hadn't had the right place to put it. So when Pom Pom came to me, like that just was the obvious um, the obvious theme for me. Well, I'm so happy that you've done it because I love it too. And I love seeing it transferred into, into knitwear. It's really exciting. And in the um, introduction that you wrote in the magazine, you also said that you like to follow the works of some runway designers like um, Alexander McQueen and Valentino and Lorenzo Serafini. So how is that helpful to you? Why do you like to watch their work? So in general, I like to work, watch like not only their work, but a lot of different designers to see what silhouettes are out there that might be something I hadn't thought of and what details um, I hadn't thought of. And then in this case, it ended up really reinforcing the idea I had like, yes, this is a good time to do this because the designers, the designers that you mentioned, um, also Ula Johnson and Jill Stewart, along with Alexander McQueen and the other ones, they really were showing these kinds of details that were kind of costume driven and Victoria driven. And that reinforced for me that this is really a good time to do this. Like, um, you know, it's one thing to be bold and out on your own, but <laughs> it, it really is nice to know that other people are thinking on this same route and that they're there will be people out there wanting to knit it as well. Exactly, because I suppose that is a, a theme that you still have to keep referring back to, don't you? I is, do. And, you know, I don't want to be the crazy one out there who's the only one thinking this. Like, it really is nice to be reinforced with, especially these very high-end designers who are the ones setting the trends for all of us. And I suppose you can also find inspiration from them because they are really using beautiful materials as well and you do get to see very fine um, crafted work on the runway don't you you're right we get to see the the best of the best craftsmanship and embroidery and shapes and and the fabrics are amazing and um, it, it's really great to have your inspiration come from the top like that so you've included a really good mix of experienced and well-known designers and newer and up-and-coming ones in this collection. So what are the qualities that you particularly admire in these designers that you've chosen? Well, first let me say that um, in my original list of designers that not everyone I asked could do it. So don't think that these were the only ones on my list. I <laughs> admire everyone who who is here in the issue, but I also had asked a few more people who couldn't do it. I know. It's a <laughs> bit of a loaded question, isn't it? <laughs> right. But um, I'll start with Cerulea because she was once my assistant at Barocco and we had a great time working together. We worked together really closely. I've always admired her sense of style and her own point of view. In fact, when we were at Barocco, she was the one who would pick the clothing to go with the sweaters. And, and I really admired how she was so good at doing that. So I knew she would be a good choice. And, um, no, I have a lot of personal connections here. Veronique Avery is on my Brooklyn Tweed design team, and I've really gotten to see her amazing attention to detail and how things are fit, how they're put together. Um, she really loves the little intricacies of a garment that sometimes you don't even see, but yeah. you do see in the results. Like, you might not notice um, these little things, but they make a huge difference in the, the finished sweater. And then uh, with... Andrea Rangel, I admire her book, Alternate, so much. Um, the little dictionary she did, I shouldn't say little, the dictionary she did <laughs> with uh, color motifs in it. And I've been watching her work for a while. Um, and I knew she'd come up with, with something good. Um, Hohi Locatelli, I love watching her stuff. And I thought this is a great opportunity to work 
with her. Um, she's one of those people who just seems to know what knitters want to knit right now and then what they want to wear at the same time and make that into one garment. Um, another personal connection is Linda Marving, who I met on a trip to Denmark uh, right after I uh, became independent in 2014 when I wasn't working for Barocco anymore. And um, since I met her, I've really looked at her garments and she has the most gorgeous and elegant cabled garments. Yeah, she does. Yeah. And, and then there's Zandi Peters, who I have met some at places like Vogue Knitting Live. And she just has the most amazing brain. Um, and she really thinks differently and she doesn't let like a technique um, being a new technique, she doesn't let that stop her. Like she really goes with it. Um, I love watching her stuff. Yeah, she's very exciting. Yeah, I first saw her with fox paws, the um, the scarf pattern, but she's done a lot of amazing things since too. Um, Honor Adams is a newcomer um, who I met, and she has her first published pattern coming soon. And I knew that she was into designing um, from earlier eras, so she was a good choice. And then. Um, I don't know quite how to say it. Is it Bodicea or Bode Bo 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 Boadicea? Boadicea. Thank you. I think. <laughs> um, so she's from the Netherlands and I have never met her. Um, I just saw her work on Ravelry and was kind of blown away. I was really impressed by some of her dramatic pieces. Um, and I, I know that she also is definitely influenced by fashion and I love her interpretation of it. And um, and then there's Caitlin Hunter, who everybody is knitting her stuff like now because it looks perfect. It's just the right thing for right now, and the color work just always um, captures my eye when I see it. Um, and so I knew I wanted to include her too. They are. It's a really great bunch of designers, and it's an exciting collection. So can you now take us through the garments and just explain to us how the designers have interpreted or realized your design brief? Um, I think I'll start with Veronique Avery. Um, her jacket is called None Such. She has used the texture and cables and the fit of this garment. Um, she's been inspired by a military coat. So what was gold trim was interpreted into cables and the fit is like a military coat and then she changed it and made it much more feminine but her original inspiration was definitely this coat that was much more gaudy and hers is very elegant. Um, with Andrea Rangel, uh, the detail that's kind of military, kind of armor-like is on the sleeves and she has a double garter ridges on the top of the sleeve and I love how it's just this one simple thing. It's a close cropped cardigan um, that doesn't, you know, it looks fashionable for now, absolutely, and then it's this one touch that brings it into my theme of the tough Victoria. Yeah, I, I think of it as a, as a little bit like um, knight's armor on the shoulder on the shoulders the top of the shoulders yeah definitely um just that one simple touch does that and yeah. then um with hohi locatelli's she used tassels to kind of define a v yoke which reminds me of like shirt waists from the victorian era so the the blouses with all sorts of tucks and lace work and maybe cables or fringe um they they would have been done in cotton but in this case this is our kind of wool equivalent and there's sweet little tassels that i think no one could object to they're so pretty and sweet um, they are yeah. yeah then uh linda marving used uh, a hem detail that's kind of reminiscent of peplums, so also of uniforms, like what might be the, on the bottom of a uniform. And then she has this lovely little detail at the top of the sleeve that's like a little roll that you might see in a medieval garment or in some sort of armor, maybe even a Viking garment. But that's what added the special touches to her cardigan with her cabled cardigan. Yeah, and also the all-over cabled pattern, which is the, the honeycomb. Mm. That also gives it a an, an armor kind of quality, doesn't it? That's true. It's a little bit like chain mail in, the, in yes. a very simple um, knit way. Yeah. 
Let's see. And Zandy Peters, she even went so far to send us a picture of a dress that was her inspiration. So this was a Victorian dress and it had two um, kind of colors of mauve and a certain kind of pleading and gathering. And so she took details from this and, and you can definitely see them in the shawl that she designed. I am not actually personally a, a shawl knitter, but I love it. I think it is such a stunning, elegant design. And I love the way the brioche is in the two slightly different tones of the pink. Right, right. At first we were afraid that those two tones were too close together, but um, they photographed well next to each other. And I thought that could, you know, it could be brilliant if it works. And, and of course it did. It worked yeah. well, the, the two very close colors. And the lattice underneath it, and then the, is it a two by two or four by four um, ribbing down the bottom is just like a ruffle, isn't it? Right, a ruffle but at without the bottom of a... being too girly, right? It's like yeah. a ruffle without being too girly. Um, so let's see, what else? Um, Honor Adams made the Gale Wood, um, Gale Wood, which are gloves, and they just hook onto the middle finger and then go down from there. So they're not like gloves for being out in the winter with, but in, out in snow, throwing snowballs. But they're lovely to have with, um, with something a little more feminine. Andrew and I are watching um, the BBC War and Peace at the moment, and they kind of fit in there. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> see, it is kind of costumes. anachronistic. These things fit with different eras, which I exactly. love that idea. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then, um, Bo I, oh no, I have so much trouble with her name. I'm so sorry. Boa de Sia. Yeah, Boa de Sia. Um, I love the very strong sleeves that she put on hers, and that you know, it's obvious that that those fit in with the theme of the Victorian sleeve. And then she has some princess seam detailing that's kind of a mix of feminine and military coat at the same time. Yes. Yeah. That, and, that is so true. Yeah. yeah. Oh, and then the, the, there are bobble, there's kind of a bobbly stitch on the shoulder that yeah. is there instead of an epaulette. So instead of being like really taking the theme um, a little too far, then the, <laughs> this texture does it instead. It does. I think it's a brilliant design. It is really exciting. It, yeah, it's fantastic. Cool. So what else have we got? Um, there's Cerulea's, who's, it's almost a cape-like garment. And this is the one I kind of pushed her to do because I loved a garment that she already had done a few years ago. It's quite different now. Like, so this is just a variation on the theme. Her original one was striped and shaped a little different. This one has some lovely details in the cable. Um, and then it's sort of cape-like, which fits with the Victorian and yet you could wear it with jeans and motorcycle boots and really tough it up. Um, and totally. the yarn in this is exquisite too. It's just the perfect, like weird, muddy purple color. It's, it's a fiber company yarn. And it's a stunning shape. I love the shape of it. Yeah. Um, let's see. Caitlin Hunter did one that has color work in the, in the sleeves, definitely the sleeves again fitting my original theme. And I like the color work looks like passementary trim, like um, that's a trim that's, that's applied afterwards in Victorian time. I don't know how else to describe it, but look up passementary and that's what this looks like. Yeah, it is fantastic, and I love the fact that it's so flamboyant, but it's also cropped, so it does look fantastic over a dress or, or jeans. Right, I think that that cropping really does help to balance out the big sleeve. Like, it wouldn't make as much sense if it were a huge silhouette with a big sleeve, but now the focus, the thing you're really looking at, is that lovely sleeve. Yeah, and balanced with the collar, with the simple colour work pattern around the collar as well, yeah. So I guess that, that leaves mine, <laughs> leaves <Yeah. laughs> the one that's on the cover. And I am very proud of this one. I really like the way it, it came out. I made up the cable first and I was looking at the kinds of patternings that are on um, Lewis Sullivan, some of the earlier, earliest skyscrapers in our country in, in Chicago, um, have these amazing decorations on them that Lewis Sullivan made up and, and had put on his buildings. And I was looking at those and I kind of vamped out from there and made the cable pattern. And then um, I had already done that before this theme was announced. And when I 
when I knew what theme I wanted to do, it just fit right in. And I realized afterwards, and people have said that that it kind of looks like armor, that there's a shield-like or exactly. armor-like way about it. Yeah, it looks like a coat of arms in a sense. You could you could envisage that at the beginning. And I love the puffy sleeves, like the leg of mutton kind of sleeve. Right. It reminds me of, you know, puffy up at the top and slimmer down the bottom. Yeah, right. it's cool. And, and the viewers will see on the, on the table behind me, there's a whole pile of, of yarn that's just arrived that I have to wind up into balls. And I am going to knit that into your design. I'm really excited. I've got to start it very soon. Oh, good. I'm so <laughs> excited to see your version of it. Yeah, my version is going to be a light version. So that'll be cool. Good. And, but it's been really fun to hear you talk more about the designs because when you describe the inspiration behind each of these design elements, it really makes each garment come alive even more and become even more interesting. So that's, that's been really valuable. So thank you so much for taking the time again to do that. Oh, good. It's been such a pleasure. Okay, well, look, let's just say goodbye to the audience and... Um, yeah, it's been really fantastic to have you again, so thank you. Okay. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye. Bye.